So someone in my Discord asked me if I could explain hexagonal architecture to them. And honestly, I haven't used it myself. There's another name for it, it's called ports and adapters. Basically, there's that architecture, there is onion layer architecture, and then there's clean architecture. They are all basically the same thing. So if you learn one, you can kind of translate them to another. But the main benefits of these architectures is to create a layer that kind of wraps your business logic and protects it from changes from external sources. So for an example, let's say you create an application that's using MySQL. Two years down the road, you realize that there's something in your application that needs to use a different type of database like Mongo or DynamoDB. What you can do is if you applied this clean architecture at the start of your you know, development process, it's very easy to swap out these external dependencies, right? You can easily swap it from writing to MySQL to writing to MongoDB. And it really just takes you to change like one line of code to kind of make that swap or maybe like one or two. Versus if you have all of these external dependencies kind of written directly into your business logic, your code can get very messy very quick and you're very coupled to these third-party dependencies, right? It makes it very hard to change out your code in the future. So if this is something that you want to kind of learn about and you're interested in hearing about, be sure to stick around. But before we dive into this topic, be sure to click that like button because it helps my channel grow. Also, be sure to click the subscribe and bell icon if you want more information like this in the future that should hopefully help you become a better web developer or software engineer. So let's just go ahead and start talking about clean architecture because that is something that we actually or that I actually use at work and I've been using it for almost three years now. So I have a decent understanding about it. I don't know if I can fully kind of talk about it because most of these architecture things are really abstract and they don't really give you concrete examples. For example, if you were to read through the clean architecture book written by um, Bob Martin or Uncle Bob, whatever his name is, it's very abstract and it's kind of hard to grasp what's going on. So let's just kind of look at some code and make this Kind of a concrete example. So I have a little express app here. And again, I'm not going to run this code because I'm just doing like pseudocode and kind of walking you through the higher level designs of how stuff can change. But a lot of people, when they're building out an express application, they'll just do something like this where they have like a, an endpoint called slash users and they'll call like a route here. So if I look at this create users route, let's kind of look through it and kind of figure out is this good code or is this bad code and how does this not work with clean, clean architecture, right? So off the bat, there's a couple things in this code that is kind of a red flag that could potentially be a huge issue down the road if you decide to switch out to a different framework or a third party um, library. So the main thing we need to kind of talk about is this key term called domain level knowledge or um, business logic. So there is a diagram that kind of explains clean architecture here. We look here, you can see there's like this circle, right? And basically you're supposed to put your frameworks or your web UIs or your libraries in this blue ring. And basically that blue ring needs to talk to gateways and those gateways need to kind of invoke use cases and those use cases talk to entities. So all this is really abstract and confusing to be honest with you all. But, but in a general sense, what you wanna do is this yellow ring, this is where you kind of have all the logic related to your, your business entities, right? So like for an example, if you have a system that you can create users in, you might want to have a user entity. And inside the entity, you have certain rules in place to make sure that a user cannot do anything in your app until they've paid, right? So that user entity could potentially be like an ES6 class or something with methods on it. And you need to kind of define the rules of a user, right? So for an example, if you don't want users to be able to create new to-do list items, if you're building like a to-do list app, you might want to add a rule in there that says, can user create to do. And that is going to be this like yellow, this yellow circle of business rules, right? So there's certain criteria that the business needs to meet or your entities need to meet before they can execute business rules. And if you go back up a level, you have this orange ring called use cases, right? We also call them interactors. Basically, this is where the core of your business lives, right? You have your application business logic in the orange ring. And then in the yellow ring, you have your business rules. Again, this is really abstract. It might not make sense. But the main take of this whole like onion architecture, hexagonal architecture, clean architecture is to kind of decouple your business logic from your external sources, right? So anything that's defined as like a database call, you really need to have like an interface defined so you can pass in a real implementation. So we're going to talk about interfaces in a bit, but anything that's in this blue circle should not bleed into your business logic, right? So for an example, if you have a business function and you see express related code in that business function, you're breaking this paradigm of clean architecture because now you're coupling really tightly to your you know, express logic. So let's go back to the code. This is probably really confusing. So the first issue with this function, if this is supposed to be like a business logic, the first issue is that we have rec and res right in this code, right? We are pulling out information from the express library 
which goes against this whole idea of like you shouldn't be coupled to your third party dependencies or your third party frameworks. So what you can potentially do is you want to kind of isolate that layer so that you don't have this stuff going on. So what you could do is I could rename this to get user um, interactor. And again, there's a lot of different ways you can kind of do this. So I'll do interactor. And we want to take out rec and res from this interactor because again, this is supposed to contain all the business rules. This is, if I go back to that diagram, this is that orange ring here, right? This is the use cases or the interactor as you can call it. So let's go ahead and try to get rid of this and really just figure out what does this business function really need? Well, it just needs a username and a password, right? That's all it needs to be able to do its job. So if we can find a way to abstract that out, then we are kind of making a more cleaner architecture and cleaner components. So let's kind of go back to the index and let's show you how you could do that. So instead of directly calling create user, in this case, I guess it would be create user interactor. You could potentially just do rec res here and I could just do some logic to basically call that with rec.body.username. Actually, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say const username and password is equal to rec.body. And then I can pass those in username and password. I think that's how I did it, yeah. So this is a step in the right direction of what hexagonal or clean architecture is all about. It's basically kind of protect your business logic from your external dependencies. So now this doesn't know about um, Express at all, right? There's no express logic in here other than at the bottom, which we're gonna have to fix as well. So right now, this is trying to call res.json, but we don't pass in res anymore, right? Because we're trying to protect this business function from knowing about express. So let's just go ahead and return, I don't know, like a user object. Again, this is all pseudocode, so none of this will actually work if I try to run it, but we can maybe just do something like this. This would be like an ID of one but I hope this all makes sense. So now this doesn't depend on the res object that comes in from Express. But in order to get this working, you gotta go back up a level. And I would probably need to just do a try catch on this, catch any errors that might happen, and just say res.status of, I don't know, 500, and then we could send back that error. All right, and then usually the interactors are gonna be like async await. So I'm just gonna go ahead and say the const new user is equal to await on that. And I'm gonna say res.json new user. All right, so again, there might be flaws in this code, but this is kind of just exemplifying how you can make your code cleaner by following a clean architecture approach. So I hope that makes sense. This interactor now knows nothing about Express and that is a good thing to do. That is how you can kind of apply clean architecture to your code base. So now if you look through this code, you will see that there are some other issues with it, right? We have direct connections to the database, which is a very, very bad approach. Right now, this code is very coupled and it's very dependent on whatever database implementation you might be using. So for example, up here, you have it requiring MySQL directly. This is bad because now our business logic is tightly coupled to MySQL. Remember, the whole point of this architecture is so you can easily swap out or exchange the different modules in the future if you decide that MySQL doesn't actually fit your business needs. So what you can do is you can make a new file or a new function and I can just call it create user. And I like to put the actual type of layer that it resides in. So I'll say like persistence. So now what we can do is inside of this business function, this interactor, we can actually import that. Now, again, this isn't the actual perfect way to do it. I need to kind of talk about dependency inversion and dependency injection in a bit. But let's just go ahead and import it for right now because it makes a little bit more sense. And what we want to do is we want to remove any traces of MySQL from this code. So let's just go back to this function here. I'm going to go ahead and import that. I'm going to go ahead and do all this logic. Again, this is just pseudocode. It probably has tons of bugs in it. But I'm going to basically do that. So now this function is the only thing that knows about MySQL, how to connect to it, how to do things with it. And we can just call it, call like const new user is equal to await on great user persistence maybe pass in a username and a password or whatever information that you want, might want. Um, let's just go ahead and just say username and password here. All right, so this is again a step in the correct direction. Now our business logic doesn't know anything about MySQL, which is a great approach, okay? So again, we're applying clean architecture to make our business logic isolated from third-party libraries. Uh, there is an extra step I need to do, but I'll talk about that in a second. And the last thing you'll see this code's doing is when a user registers, we need to send out an SES email. So let's just go ahead and create a new method called 
sin registration email uh, persistence or something. And this is just a name convention. You don't have to name stuff con uh, persistence if you think it's a stupid name, but I'm going to go ahead and say sin registration email persistence. And again, this function really just needs to care about how to send the email. You don't want to have business logic about like what the email should say. So I'm going to go ahead and just extract all this code and put it inside this function. Go ahead and do this. And I think that should be good. Now I'll go ahead and call send registration email. Now what we need to actually do is probably send who that's going to. So I'll say like uh, to and I'll say email or username. We'll just assume username is an email. And I will say body is welcome to the application. And again, we'll probably have to await on it because this is probably going to be an asynchronous function. But I hope you understand like what we're getting at. I'll go ahead and change that to email and I'll change this to body. And then somewhere down here, like we'd probably use body. We probably want to do subject as well. And this could be email. All right, so this, hopefully that kind of works if we actually like tested that, but let's do subject and say like, welcome. And of course we could probably just return new user here instead. Let's pause for a second. Let's inspect this code and understand what happened. So we now have this business logic that doesn't know anything about how to send an email. All it knows is that I have a function I can call. And it also doesn't know anything about databases. It doesn't know that I'm using SQL. It doesn't know I'm using MongoDB. All it knows is that I can call a method that's going to persist a user, okay? This is how you basically set up clean architecture. Now there is another step I need to talk about and it's all about how dependencies are set up. So right now, this business logic still depends on functions that are tightly coupled to MySQL, right? So now this whole thing is still coupled to MySQL. It might not look like it, but in a sense, you're requiring these functions that are coupled to MySQL, so it's very hard to test and it's very hard to switch these out later on. So one approach that we do to kind of reduce the coupling is your interactor should basically depend on interfaces, right? So inside of the, this should be kind of like an interface that it calls and it just needs to pass whatever data to the interface and the logic should happen behind the scenes. So how do we solve this and how do we make this more decoupled? Well, basically you need to have this depend on interfaces, right? So instead of calling the actual implementation here, it needs to call an interface and you need to pass in the correct parameters or arguments that the interface needs. So one way you can achieve this is by using inversion of control and a specific way to implement inversion of control is by using dependency injection. So inversion control is basically doing what I'm saying. Instead of this thing requiring and depending these directly, you can have these passed in. And dependency injection is one approach to kind of implementing inversion of control. So what does it mean to have it passed in? Well, by using dependency injection, we could actually just pass in some methods here. And these methods could basically do the exact same thing, right? So these are gonna be like interfaces in a sense, but now this business logic doesn't know how these things are implemented. So whatever is calling this business logic can swap out the implementation details on the fly if you want to, or you can use like a framework that does, you know, the built-in dependency injection or something like that. But right now this is called like function injection, but there's also like constructor injection. If you're doing uh, ES6 classes, you can in the constructor, you can kind of inject whatever dependencies that you want. You could also do like setter injection where you have like a class that has setter functions. You can call those setter functions to basically set these things. But I personally like using functions and I like to pass in the dependencies inside of the arguments here. So then you might say, well, then how do I actually pass in these methods? So let's go back to the create user interactor where we call it in the index here. And now what you do at a higher level, you need to basically import these two things. So let's just go ahead and import those real quick. I could do, um, which ones do I want? I want to create user persistence is going to be require. So I'll require that one. And then I'm also going to require send registration email persistence and do that. All right. So now there's only like a single place that I'm kind of setting up the actual implementations. Honestly, if you're using TypeScript, this thing would depend on interfaces here and not actual implementations. And then you pull in 
the actual implementations here, which would kind of extend that interface, and you would basically just pass them in like so, right? So I would just pass those in. All right, so now we actually kind of fully did clean architecture. We have a business function that doesn't depend on MySQL. All it depends on is an interface that knows how to connect to a database. And then also it knows how to send out an email. Again, it doesn't care how that implementation is done. You could use SendGrid, you could use SES from Amazon. The business logic doesn't care. All it knows is that I have a method I can call. And when I call that method, an email is sent out somewhere. So this is now clean. This actually abides by clean architecture. This thing doesn't depend on any methods that are kind of hard coded in the third party libraries. And all of these are passed in using dependency injection. More specifically, it's function injection, but I hope this all makes sense. There's different ways that you can kind of achieve the whole dependency inversion, dependency injection by using like a framework that kind of does that for you. I know if you've touched Angular before, like they have built in ways to do this dependency injection approach, which is great. And I think there's a couple of node frameworks that kind of do the, the whole dependency injection for you. So if you do want to go down this, this road of like clean architecture or hexagonal architecture, I definitely recommend that you check out a framework or library that can kind of do this for you. So honestly, that was like a really high level quick overview. I don't know how much more like in depth you can kind of get into this stuff. You can kind of, the, the main issues I have with reading this clean architecture book or talking about hexagonal architecture is that these people talk about really abstract concepts and they can just ramble on forever about these concepts and not actually show you how to implement them, right? So what I'm kind of gearing towards in this video is just show you how you can implement it and not get you all caught up in the weeds of like, oh, this is an abstract, this is an interface, this is a port, this is an adapter. Again, the main goal is just isolate your business rules from your third-party dependencies. And I didn't really talk about entities here. I know if I go back to that graph, there's like a yellow entity. But typically what you do is you probably have some type of const user entity. So I could say like user entity. That might take in a username and a password. So use your imagination. If we made another file called user entity, that could be an E6 class that has some methods on it. And I could say user dot validate or something. That's what we mean when we say business entities. You have these like these things, these either ESX classes or methods or functions that you can basically create or construct these entity objects. And there's logic that's built into these entities to make sure that certain things are met. So for an example, let's say you actually did have a user entity. Let's just go ahead and pretend like we have one. All right, so let's pretend this is like an ES6 class. This has a constructor and this might have like a this dot, um, this dot uh, username is equal to username and this dot password is equal to password, right? So let's just pretend that we have this. And it also has a validate method, which will basically throw new an error if something is invalid. What you can actually do inside of this is you can say if the password uh, length is less than six. I could just throw like a uh, invalid, invalid password error. All right. So this again, this is like pseudocode, but this is the gist of what an entity is. You have like these properties that you store on this like data object, and these and these entities have methods that you can do to change username, change the password, validate that everything is proper before you actually start saving that into the database. Right. So here I could potentially just save the user into the database if you wanted to. There's more caveats about clean architecture that I could kind of touch on, but basically this is how we do this at my job. We've been doing this for like three plus years now. We have a ton of different entities that contain all the business rules and the business logic of how do you like validate certain things, meet certain criterias, and it can get really complex really quick. So it's good to structure your code to make sure that all this is set up properly with entities. You can validate those entities and then you need to persist them somewhere. And then at this case, we send out an email. So yeah, that's about all I wanted to talk about with clean, clean architecture. I hope this was a good overview. I know I went kind of fast and some of this stuff can be really confusing, but if you don't feel like you learned much, leave a comment below. Maybe I can kind of dive more into the detail about this video. Like always, be sure to click the like button if you enjoyed this video, because it helps my channel grow. And also be sure to click that subscribe and bell icon if you're new to this channel and you want to get better at software engineering or web development, because I'll have other videos like this in the future that should hopefully help with that. Have a good day, happy coding.